Hello, and thank you for joining, uh, joining today's skills webinar, How to Make Your Games More Profitable and Fun. We're glad to see so many of you have joined us live, and I know you'll be glad you did. My name is David Dolnick and with Skills, and I have the distinct privilege of moderating today's webinar. I'm glad to introduce you to Craig Churchill. Craig is the CRO at Skills in a career that has spanned 25 years. He's worked in a variety of executive roles at some of the world's leading technologies, including IGT, Oracle, Sun Microsystems, Silicon Graphics, Dell, and Microsoft. Please say hi, Craig. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. I also happy to introduce you to Nathan Karklins, our other speaker today. Nathan is a senior designer at Skills. He lives and breathes tech. He's worked at Capcom, Zynga, Glue, and Big Fish. His accolades are shared with many teams of talented people, four mobile titles that have earned Apple's Editor Choice Awards, several projects honored on Game of the Year, and top grossing award lists. Nathan, please say hi. Hi, everyone. Really excited to be here. Today we're excited to provide an overview of how the Skill Platform can introduce a new profitable revenue stream for mobile game developers that the, sa the same enhances the player experience. We'll save about 20 minutes to answer your questions at the other end of the webinar, but you don't have to wait until the end to submit your questions. Please use the chat button on the lower left to send questions as they occur to you. We'll try to get as many of your questions as we can. Before we start, a couple housekeeping items. Uh, all participants will be muted throughout the duration of the presentation to ensure the best audio quality for all. During the presentation, if you should encounter any audio issues, please refresh your browser and check your computer's audio setting. Again, submit your questions anytime during the webinar. Just click the chat button to do so. Lastly, we're recording today's webinar and we'll share it with you a link in our follow-up. That way you can listen to it again and even share it with others who may, might be interested. Now we've got a poll. We'd love to learn a little about you. Uh, we've got everybody. Um, we have a quick poll so we can now see who everybody is dialing in. This will be your chance to um, show where you're from. Great, we've got an awesome group. Now it's time to hear from our speakers. Take it away, Greg. Uh, thanks very much, David. Well, so based upon the poll results, I should say good morning, good afternoon, and probably good evening, wherever you're calling in from. Um, as David alluded to, I'm, I'm Craig, Craig Churchill. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at Skills. And I'm really very excited to welcome you to the first in a series of quarterly webinars. This one is specifically focused on the topic of making your mobile game more fun and profitable. Now, I know this is a quest that at times feels probably quite unattainable to the seasoned game designer, but hopefully during the course of the next 30 minutes or so, it's a topic we can add additional food for thought around. To help me today, I'm joined by a good friend and a colleague of mine, Nathan Carklins, who is a senior game designer here at Skills. Uh, Nathan, welcome. It's great to have you alongside me here today. Thank you, Craig. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> uh, now, by way of background, Nathan has had a, uh, a super career working for the likes of Zynga and Big Fish, among many others. And I thought I'd invite him along as he has somewhat of a unique perspective of the game designer's plight that I thought you would appreciate. Um, stylistically, I, I was asking Nathan this question this morning. What what kind of game designer are you? I wanted to get a sense of your, your history and, and whether or not that's evolved over a period of time. What, how would you depict yourself as a game designer, Nathan? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think long-term vision really is to become a creative director. Um, in my history, really have done, focused on uh, systems and feature work. Um, really excited about bringing new and exciting content to players, so that's really where I've tried to focus. Yeah. And, and I, I'm assuming that, um, I mean, I can probably talk to this firsthand, but since joining Skills, your, your skill set has evolved much more towards the kind of thinking about monetization. And yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's been really exciting. So having worked at a lot of different companies and having access to all those different titles has really given me sort of the unique uh, perspective to be able to work with the teams that we bring on to make sure that we're creating the best solutions together. No, that's great. For my part, I've been in the gaming industry for quite some time now, and I've met and worked with a lot of mobile game developers over the years. And I have to say, the most common challenge that they all bring up time and time again is, of course, no surprise, monetization. Um, this is a, a real classic dilemma, and, it, and it's understandable why it's so common, right? I mean, because in the past, ads and IAPs were really the only way to monetize mobile games. But 
I think times have changed, and the great thing about Nathan is he's able to bring a, a real solid perspective to the table that's quite frankly grounded in his experience of having designed very successful games in inside skills and outside of skills. I think the, the knowledge that he brings to the table of how challenging and frustrating it can be to integrate ads and IAPs into the game flow, and most importantly to this conversation, he's also fully conversant in what we're calling the third way of monetization, which is really an alternative path to revenue that works for developers and players alike and that can provide returns that, again, frankly, are way in excess of the best monetizers around. So what is the future of mobile game monetization? Uh, really, that's what we're going to cover today. So I'll take you to the next slide. So listen, first of all, don't get me wrong. In-app purchases are a great way to get players who love your game to spend money. But the reality is less than 2% of mobile gamers are actually willing to input their payment information and go through the whole process of, um, of going, you know, doing that and purchasing uh, in a free-to-play game. So it is really a challenge. Now, Nathan, you've been on both sides of this fence, right? Do you, do you have any perspective or insights from your experience as a designer that you want to bring into the conversation? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, that low number is some of the reason why engagement and retention is really important. Obviously, the longer a player stays in your game, the more opportunities for them to monetize. Um, but there's really limited ways of doing that. And a lot of the ways that you're monetizing on players are sort of put into the early funnel uh, and impact both retention and engagement. Um. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think the, the notion of breaking the creative flow as well, I mean, that's a real... Yeah, that's the worst. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier wanting to be creative director and you're really focused on sort of what is the vision for the player and how are they excited about playing and what's really uh, eye-catching for them. And, you know, being hit with some of these, uh, you know, IAPs or uh, interstitials and things like that, um, yeah. they really break that uh, continuity for the player, and that really pulls them out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I think, you know, ads too are obviously a great source of revenue. Um, they're really easy, and they're a simple way to monetize your gamers. But I know it, and you know it, and the not so small elephant in the room is that people aren't very big on ads. And the reason for this is they obviously are pretty disruptive to a player's experience, as well as, as, well as the purity of the game. I mean, it's, it's really hard to get above a few cents in Arpdow with ads, no matter how hard you push them. Again, I'd, I'd love to get your take on this particular point, Nathan. I'm sure you, you've had to go through the task of designing games around ads before. And I, I think, you know, as, as you compare your experience on AAA titles, to mobile game design, one thing about mobile is you really have to picture the arc of monetization at the very kind of offset of game design. Um, would love your perspective on that. Yeah, so if you're a player like me, uh, then you see an ad and your brain instantly shuts off. So you're, you're pulling away from the screen or even worse, you're putting down the app forever. Um, so that's obviously something that uh, you need to be very careful about. Um, there are modern mechanics. Um, there's gotcha and progression and uh, continuation flows and things like that that work themselves into mobile games. Um, and they need to do it in a sensitive way so that the player still feels like they, that they're, that they exist in the game story fiction. Mm. And, and I suppose we, we were joking about this earlier, but it's about getting the player in the mood, right? Yeah. Um, and then you sort of break the illusion of that using when you, when you use ads. Um, that must be a real challenge for the game designer too. It can be a really horrible experience when you have an epic gameplay moment that's happening for the player and then it's ended uh, instantly when they're you know, told about some random uh, game or they're told about some random product. The issue really here is that the successful uh, versions of ads really bring players away from your game. Um, they interrupt them in the moments that you're trying to cherish and they bring them uh, to another product or another place, um, and there's no guarantee that, that that player actually returns. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, that's, I mean, that's interesting. I, I think, you know, as a level set for the audience, I think everyone is kind of familiar with that, with that feel, especially if you're a game designer uh, for mobile on the phone. So the net of all of this is in today's mobile gaming landscape, um, you know, it's super intense, and, and the need to monetize is ever-present at every, at every corner, really. And if you're not charging your players to download your game, then you're either using ads, which, as we've just discussed, causes the break-in game flow, and also the break-in focus, more importantly for gamers, 
or you're trying to sell them a competitive advantage or a feature through a set of IAP options. And you know, quite frankly, the money isn't as stellar as you would like in most cases. It's a real challenge. So with this in mind, um, speaking from a, from a very skills perspective, you know, we sought to tackle the problem head on and create this thing that I mentioned earlier, the third path to monetization. And really it's all about how we can introduce a new profitable revenue stream for mobile game developers that at the same time enhances the player experience. Now that sounds a bit like an oxymoron, right? I mean, make money for you, keep purity of the game mechanic, and create a compelling experience for your players. So Nathan, how did we manage to achieve all of this? That's uh, really exciting for me. Uh, that's a problem that I love to, to be challenged by. It's a problem that I love to solve. Uh, I think uh, what I hate on is bolt-ons. Uh, as a senior director that I worked with on Facebook social games earlier in my career, uh, he called them design tumors. Uh, so you have sort of these, uh, you have, have these mechanics like inviting friends for installs or daily calendars or hurry up and wait, or really what I call them, um, give away wheel spins or worse, the disruptive ads that we were talking about before. And that's the reason that the thing that we're really offering here is competitive multiplayer. And that's why um, it sort of courts my muse. It allows us to give players meaningful gameplay and there's nothing more rewarding for me than that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think through the, through the competitive multiplayer you know, angle, it's all about leveraging the thrill of competition. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's what it's all about, and that's the, and that's the kind of hook that we're playing into here. Um, and I think early on, we realized that there was a huge group of people out there who wanted the exciting experience of competing, but they wanted that, um, they wanted that on a level playing field, and they were willing to pay for the privilege. So I think, I think that's really interesting. The other thing is, what we're doing here by playing into the thrill of competition is we're, we're sort of tapping into the dynamics of what neuroscientists would say make something compelling and make a compelling game. I mean, it first of all has to exhibit novelty. There has to be anticipation in the game mechanic. And ideally, it has to be social. And together, these elements come together to drive some sort of emotional connection that contributes to an enhanced player experience, which for us is all about competition, competitive multiplayer, and the thrill of the win. Okay, so time for another quick poll, and I think this one is specifically to do with how many titles you're dealing with as game developers. So go ahead and, Ooh. yeah, I'm in Wait and anticipation. I'm... Okay, so we have some 11 plus titles here. This is, this is, oh, a real mix. Good job. Okay, perfect. I think that's pretty much everyone. So actually a real, a real nice, a real nice blend of, uh, of folks on the phone that deal with a range of titles. Um, I think one of the huge benefits then, going back to my previous point of playing into this compelling hook of the thrill of the competition, is that competitive gamers is just simply more engaged. Right? Yep. At an aggregate, yeah. I mean, at an aggregate level, they're more inclined to pay more right, than the single player. Uh, or their single player mode counterparts, and they retain for incredible amounts of time. In fact, we see competitive multiplayers monetizing up to six times better, while at the same time spending twice as much time in app, which is, you know, from our standpoint and from the developer's standpoint, pretty, pretty phenomenal. If we take a look at the profile of the typical competitive mobile gamer, Nathan, wh what do we, what do we see here? What, who are we, who are we playing into? Yeah, so I think that's uh, really one of the most uh, interesting things that I've, I've discovered is that historically you think that the player uh, of an esports title is going to be young and male and, uh, you know, testosterone driven. And uh, that really underserved uh, a large market that sort of exists on mobile in the free-to-play space, um, largely older and female. And as we started to bring on a lot of games uh, onto the skills platform, we're discovering that the markets are very similar to what's existing in free-to-play. And that opens up our ability to work with these developers and bring them and their games onto the skills platform and make them esports. Uh, and it allows them to sort of lean into the players that they know and have been tracking for some time now. 
I think one of the, the most fascinating things for me uh, was when we ran our top 10 player poll recently, and we, we published the results um, probably about a month ago. And out of the top 10 uh, most prolific players on our platform, uh, seven of them were female. Yeah. Which I, which I think is an interesting skew. I mean, on aggregate, it's slightly skewed towards female, but within different genres, we've got this heavy skew towards male, whether it's sports-oriented content. But top 10, 70% female. I mean, yeah, that's just, that's I, exciting. Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, very, very pleased to see that indeed. So I think, um, again, continuing to build upon this notion of the player, what, what are their needs? And I think in addition to the neuroscientist's view of the world, of what makes a game compelling, you know, I spoke about novelty, sort of social, you've got to have an element of anticipation, etc. Bringing this down to brass tacks and a very practical perspective of what competitive gamers are looking for, it's really three main things, right? I mean, I think the first thing is quite simply the ability to compete against real people. And you see the success of this dynamic, for example, in the growing popularity of PvP games. I mean, that, that, that it's just exploding whether it's mobiles or otherwise. People like to play against real people for validation, uh, but also to test their skills. And in fact, there's a, there's a fascinating book written by um, an associate of mine, a gentleman called Stephen Kotler. Now, Stephen wrote a book called The Rise of Superman, which is all about how our brain recalibrates what we think is possible every time we see a new achievement. Okay, it's called, not surprisingly, the Roger Bannister effect. So think about this. Roger Bannister was the first man to run a mile in under four minutes. And before he accomplished this in 1954, for decades, people had thought that a four-minute mile simply wasn't possible. It was beyond the capability of humankind. However, once he did it, someone else broke his record just two months after him. His record was broken again twice within the next five years. And then 10 years later, our high school student ran a four-minute mile. So there's clearly, there's clearly something innate in us that wants to calibrate our skills against others. So this notion of competing against real people and you know, really testing your mettle against their skills is something that rise, it's the rising tide that rises all boats. So we just recalibrate time and time again. I think the second thing competitive gamers are looking for, and this is obviously is of no great surprise, is, pri is prizes. Um, and of course, recognition for their victories. Everybody wants to be rewarded for their hard earned efforts. And whether or not that is just simply chess beating or smack talking or whatever it is, you know, the, the recognition element and the reward is just simply a great motivator. Um, now, Nathan, I sense you want to say something on the Evergreen yes, experience. Yes, I see you chomping at the bit there. Yeah, so I guess, uh, I mean, Evergreen is, is a term that uh, is used in the game industry often to talk about sort of mechanics that can be reusable um, from, match, from game to game uh, on our system from matches to matches. Um, but it isn't really just level design. Uh, and I think that there's ways that uh, we're seeing that, that are really successful um, that can sort of be drawn from even chance-based models. So like um, the kind of animations and effects that are happening in slot machines or idle games, which you wouldn't classify as a skills-based game, the way that those titles are using kinetic energy and the way that they're escalating the degree of fanfare during the celebration, it helps, uh, it helps reinforce and reward the innovation piece. Um, but it also feels like a good moment of, of a win, too. And I think that's baked into sort of the thrill of competition because you feel like you're being celebrated. Um, you feel like there's, there's a parade for you. Uh, and the reward and, and motivation piece is also sort of reflected there. Um, mm. it's, it's interesting. Mm. Yeah, it's something I find um, really exciting. I, I think also, just to, to kind of key off on your point there, I think, you know, Players like the ability to own their skills, no matter what it is, over and over again. And I think, much like a real sport, the ability to train and practice to be at the top of their game is really, really critical for them. So if you think about it, games like chess, games like backgammon or soccer, and I say soccer because I'm obviously very British and I, I do like a good game of football, but they change very little over the years, but they retain sort of astronomical rates of engagement. And this is because the player's need for new, exciting experiences 
is fulfilled through competition. And that's, you know, if you, if you imagine the players running through a green field, it's a whole new world of opponents to go after. It's new strategies to, to tap into. And it's the ever-present pre, ever desire to be the best. I mean, that, that's essentially what it's all about. And that, that is, that is the, the kind of the, the summation on the three, the three elements that uh, the players are really looking for. The thing that I really like about sport is uh, sort of how it creates a cause for the player. It focuses them uh, and underlines uh, your point, I think, perfectly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, let's face it. I think brands like Supercell and Blizzard Entertainment are leading the industry in terms of monetization and engagement. And they, they've done that by offering multiplayer competition. That exactly speaks to our point uh, within the realm of their expect expertise, of course. But Clash Royale and Vainglory didn't just come about overnight. <clears throat> so, yeah, huge yeah, game. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, lots, lots of money, lots of years, and lots of people sort of were working on uh, those types of games. Developing that kind of game comes with a significant cost, too. So, I mean, your competitive multi -game, multiplayer games require additional layers of support. Um, you have to add infrastructure to ensure fair play. Um, there needs to be a cohesive matching system. Uh, if there's a prize distribution, that needs to be worked out. Lo loyalty and engagement mechanics, player chat, etc. Uh, these are very, very complicated games. And very costly as well. It's like a lot of money yeah. to build. Yeah. So I think the, the decision point in any game developer's uh, existence is, you know, build versus buy. Um, and I think it's a valid it's a valid question they have to ask themselves. But just you know, bear in mind this infrastructure costs a lot of money. In fact, I was talking to a large game studio um, just last week who had told me that the cost of maintaining live operations and infrastructure was becoming quite literally taxing to their very existence. Their resource pyramid inside the company had gone through a telling inversion for them. And they'd explained to me that you know, once upon a time they spent the majority of their resources back in the day on new game ideation and new game creation and innovation. However, after they released a few successful titles, their resources subsequently shifted towards live operations and away from what had made them so successful in the first place. The content treadmill. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a really expensive, expensive game and you have to be very conscious of how you keep your foot on the pedal of innovation while at the same time sustaining um, your existing titles. And it's not an easy equation to crack. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. So anyway, we have uh, another poll, um, and this one focuses on how you, in fact, monetize your games today. So go ahead and make your submissions. Okay, so we've got game purchase, a lot of advertising, a lot of in-app purchase, and some esports competition. Okay, that's really, that's really good. Okay, I am going to... I think that's pretty much about everyone, so I'm going to move on. So referring back to the resource, uh, the cost, and the focus challenges of creating, launching, and then sustaining successful games, I mean, this is where, precisely where we come in, right? This is, we've spent a lot of time, in fact, the past five years of building out the competitive stack. So um, I should say the competitive technology stack and the competitive services stack that you need to transform any mobile game into a competitive multiplayer. And, I, and I, I say any mobile game, I mean, because the genres that we play with at Skills are pretty diverse. We, um, we see solitaire games monetizing exceptionally well on our platform, puzzle games, sports games, I alluded to earlier, match threes, bubble shoes, and, and then moving up towards mid-core games now as we're bringing new titles into the, in, into the stable. Um, maturing, you might say. Maturing, yes, absolutely. And I, and I think it's important to say that we go way beyond just price fulfillment. Um, this is a true multi-layered technology competition as a service uh, through which we manage all live operations on behalf of our game developers, which really allows them to focus on what they do best, which is build exciting, innovative, experiential games. So. A little bit more on that. Nathan, why don't you tell me about this services stack? Yeah, I mean, we've come a long way since, since I've even come here. Uh, Skills had already built out a free-to-download SDK 
Um, it's extremely easy to integrate. Uh, it's cross-platform capable. Uh, it has built-in tournament infrastructure, real-time analytics, clear and concise revenue statements. Um, what else? Uh, live 24-7 technical support. Um, there's an ex the piece that I find really interesting is the sort of anti-cheating and anti-fraud measurements. Uh, my team and I also support in helping teams choose sort of less ris risky designs for the games that they want to bring on. Um, and it, I mean, it really, Skills has built everything that, uh, that a developer needs in order to bring their game on and, and feel safe and comfortable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I think there's additional elements as well. Uh, so let me, let me just jump to the next slide here. <clears throat> yeah, so I mean with skills, players can, uh, they can compete for both virtual currency and real world prizes. Um, players um, are matched based on their skill level through a machine learning algorithm. Uh, there are replays for each of the matches um, which can be shared through normal social streams, so like uh, friends list, chat functionality. Uh, our tournaments take several forms. There's small tournaments from head to head, one on one, to bracketed where you have head to head uh, over a course of matches, uh, eventually leading to a leader. There's live stream competitions, um, professional leagues with up to, I don't know, 50,000 players. Yep. Um, the thing that I think is the most important piece here is that it, it's really scalable. So, I mean, you can have DAO of 100 or DAO of 100,000, um, and uh, it, it provides the experience that gamers want. It's the competitive arena that they're looking for. Yeah, and, and it's interesting. We, we started to dabble with some, some interesting uh, viral features, social features over the past few months like chat, and we're building that into all of our games. Now, and it obviously it started off as a bit of a test and we didn't know what level of engagement we would get from, from doing chat. Um, and the results were actually really interesting, quite phenomenal. People getting to know each other uh, in the game itself, challenging each other to matches, comparing scores, and literally staying on chat all night long, just hanging out and building their own community around that particular game. And we saw it in games like Cube Cube, for example. It's yeah, it's a comfortable place to chat on yeah. your phone. You're, it's, it's a behavior that you're used to. It's very natural, isn't it? And as a, the other interesting thing is, as a consequence, we saw a, a retention lift of about 8% uh, off the back of implementing chat, which, in fact, is you know, pretty, pretty significant in, in this game itself. So... I guess the big question is how do how do you how do we how does everyone generate revenue from all of this? And Nathan, I, you've got a nice analogy uh, that I've heard you use in the past around mm -hmm. this that I quite like. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, comparing this to different types of game models, like free to play, for example, like I feel like the free to play model is really like. Uh, it's like maybe going to an amusement park and exiting through the gift shop. Um, so you're hit with like buy this, buy this, buy this, um, these interstitials sort of are flooding in the screen. What we're really trying to create is, uh, is like a really awesome club where there's a cover charge and, uh, and you feel like, you know, a champion for entering the door. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And if I, if I sort of relate, you know, the, the, the angle of monetization back to um, one of the inception goals, one of the big audacious goals of skills back in the day, it really was around how do we create a thriving ecosystem where developers could make money, players could earn a living, which is interesting. Um, and an example of how this works in practice today is borne out by what I mentioned earlier, our top 10 player results from 2017. Our top winner in 2017 grossed $460,000. And the funny story Wait, here is... that number again. Yeah, $460,000. And the funny story is that she was earning the majority of these winnings on a 10-pin bowling game. And had she have been on the pro circuit for PBA, she would have been the number two earner in the league. I love professional it. Player. I love it. It's pretty phenomenal. And the other fun fact is that our top developers um, are, in, are in the top 10 in revenue per install in the entire app store. So if this is a monetization engine that works, um, that works exceptionally well. So, Nathan, I know you can speak to this firsthand, right, this next slide, with skills you say time and money, because you deal with developers day in and day out. So how easy is it to integrate skills into, into a game? Uh, quickly, super easy. Uh, I mean, skills as an SDK that's free to download. The integration process is extremely simple. A uh, single developer can start and finish the integration in just about five days. 
Um, we have a, we've seen even significantly faster, but you know, let's not break our necks. Yeah. Um, I mean, everyone says that, right? Here's an SDK. It's a great set. It'll take you. It'll yeah. Take you days. But one of my tasks when I first joined the company was to integrate the SDK. Me, I'm not a technical person, <laughs> right? By any stretch of the imagination, sure. and I did it, and it didn't take that long. So, if, if that's proof, then, or maybe I am more technical than I imagine. <laughs> I don't know. Um, the other, the other interesting thing here is around the stats is players in general have won uh, over $190 million worth of prizes uh, to date across thousands of games on the skills platform. And the average player spends around about 60 minutes, um, around about an hour a day competing on our platform, which is nearly double the average of 33 minutes in the industry. So you can see an 8% lift due to a single feature like chat is, is very powerful for everyone indeed. And last but not least, I mean, Skills has proven to boost revenue for mobile game developers. Right? That's why we're sort of all here on the call. On average, across our platform, developers who've made a multiplayer game with us have increased D30 retention by around about 24% and boosted average daily revenue per daily active user by about 18 cents. And, and They've achieved all of this with absolutely zero impact on their existing ad or IAP revenue stream. So the, the great thing I like to talk about is this is a purely accretive revenue stream, which is absolutely fantastic. So Nathan, in your experience, right, I'm assuming that's a substantial yeah. opt-out. Right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And how, how would you say we compare against other good monetizers in the industry? Uh, um, sig we do significantly better. Um, the, I guess the, the piece that I think is really exciting here is, uh, so like oftentimes we suggest that uh, sort of the gameplay that we bring on to skills is done in additional queue uh, with some slight modifications to TOS compliancy. And that allows the companies that we're dealing with to sort of maintain all the revenue streams that they had previously, um, but then also gain uh, the ability to monetize on their players in this new way. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's really interesting. Thanks. So, well, obviously the thrill of competition clearly works. There's something in that. Uh, developers have a lot to gain from this monetization method. Players are highly attuned to the competitive dynamic as we spoke about earlier, and they're making a living out of it even. So how is the, the, the part of the equation for skills? How are we doing? And, and I sort of wanted to put, pop this slide in because I think it's important to recognize that um, when developers work with us, they're dealing with a, a really interesting company. So skills was ranked number one fastest growing private company in America on the Inc. 5000 list. That was a recent uh, accolade that, that we were given. And that was against a three-year growth of about 50,000%, so you know, pretty significant. We've got, we've got over 12 million registered players on the platform, over 3,000 developers and studio partnerships. And, and actually, as of today, we're powering somewhere in the order of a million tournaments a day now, which is absolutely fantastic. And we've seen significant growth in the amount of tournaments being played. Um, and in terms of the game content partnerships that we're now forging, some really, really interesting and incredible IP joining the stable. And I, I talked about you know, going maturing, as you put it, from the super casual up to very highly streamable titles that are challenging the mid-core space. And one final thing that, that I'll provide a teaser on here, and I won't go into detail because I know we're up against time, is that we have really only spoken about one aspect of our offering today. And the potential of the other half for game studios is enormous in terms of reach capability. And that's our skills arena streaming technology. And the, the single thing to, to note here is that entertainment distribution platforms, right, whether it's OTT services or the like, um, are genuinely on the phone every day wanting to talk to me about the potential to unlock millions of players and paying players on that OTT service working with skills. So it's a really interesting endeavor, uh, and it's something I would, I would absolutely love to bring to, to this table in a webinar soon. And I promise it will be, um, it will be one of the, web, uh, the webcasts coming up very soon. Uh, so please be sure to join us on that next chapter. I think, Nathan, we'll be jumping into a Q&A in a second, but before we do that, I wanted to thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, and I also wanted to thank the audience very much. I know you've taken time out of your busy schedules, morning, afternoon, and evening, uh, to tune in today. And um, we very much look forward to speaking with you all again in the near future. Nathan, do you have any parting words before, before we sign off? Uh, 
No, no, okay, well, very good, thank you, yeah. I appreciate it. So <laughs> we do have a Q&A, um, so please be sure to send us any questions via the WebEx chat feature. Okay. Okay, so what we're gonna do, actually, I did see one question come up a second ago about, um, do you play these games yourselves? Huh. And Every day. Yeah. Every day. So what, one fun fact about skills is that every single day, we, every single week, we have to play at least 35 games. Uh, and that's great for QA feedback. It's also good because it gives us a sense of the game flow and everything. Um, and if you, if you play 50 games, you get, to, uh, you get to spin a wheel, and if your name gets selected, you get to choose lunch for the whole company. So yes, indeed, we do, we do certainly uh, get to play all of these games ourselves. Um, uh, do we, so do we support Unity? That's a good question for you, Nathan. Yeah, we do. We, do. Um, we have a number of developers that use Unity, uh, and uh, the thing that I really like about that is it allows the games to be cross-platform a lot yeah. faster. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, one question that keeps uh, coming up time and time again um, is, you know, is, this, is this legal? Right? Where is this legal? Um, one important point to note is that our games work off uh, a skills-based algorithm, and they're not a game of chance. And we've, we have a patented algorithm designed by professors from, from Dartmouth University that determine the game is skills-based and not chance-based. Therefore, this allows us to become legal in, I think it's like 39 states, uh, further, th uh, further nine states permit cash tournaments, and we're legal in 80% of the world. Uh, so. Um, that answers that question. Okay, what else we've got here? So, as a small developer, can we use your 12 million players to fuel our skills games? Um, so, th there's, there's a, the interesting angle here, uh, this is to Nate, is that as game developers come onto our platform, we are highly protective of that individual game developer's audience. So, it would be wrong of us to take your audience that you, that you carry with you from your game as you're cross-promoting onto our platform, um, and then kind of share that amongst other, other games. So we're very, very cognizant of that, first of all. The one thing I would say is that we, um, we do from time to time send out emails that recognize games of the week, and so that, that promotes games across the network. And I alluded to the fact um, just a few moments ago that we do have this huge streaming initiative and the streaming initiative itself um, is really going after those millions of eyeballs out there uh, that are hungry to play games and also play in the competition. So the opportunity to build um, an even larger install base is ever present on our platform. Yeah, we have a website that people can also visit to see uh, the games that uh, are, are sort of trending uh, as top games on our lists. Um, and we have a number of developers that have multiple titles uh, across sort of the, the platform, uh, and they're finding a lot of success in cross-promoing cross -promoing between those titles. Yep. Some other uh, questions that are coming in. So how do I know if my game is a good game for the platform? Well, uh, I guess we make that a little bit easier for you. Every game um, that sort of uh, that I guess let me take a step back for a second. Uh, we have a, an evaluation process that we use in order to determine whether or not a game uh, we believe is a good fit. Uh, a lot of this is informed by games that we have that are already existing uh, on the platform, uh, experience that we have within the design team and others uh, to make sure that uh, that the game has a compatible sort of themes or genre mechanics, controls, audience profiles, things like that. Um, we have uh, a team that I work with directly uh, that uh, reviews those games uh, and provides uh, recommendations for what the best fit is in order to bring them onto skills. Um, and uh, that makes it very easier, easy for companies that have a title that they want to know uh, whether or not it's a good fit in order for us to sort of uh, evaluate and get back to them on. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Um, another couple of uh, really important questions coming in. So can skills help me market my game? 
this comes from Chris, uh, so I can focus on making games. Well, I think two things to, to, to notice, Chris, is we have two avenues for developers to work with skills. One avenue um, is under a self-service kind of terms of, uh, terms of service, which is you can download the SDK free of charge. You can integrate that SDK, hopefully in a matter of hours, if not a couple of days, and you're off to the races. You're on the platform. Um, the, thing that, the, the thing that we're most proud of is that a huge amount of our business from the early days is as a result of those kinds of indie developers coming on board and integrating their games on the form. And we've had uh, developers that quite literally uh, had left large game studios. They set about this task all by themselves with practically zero revenue. And today they're multi-million design shops, multi-million dollar design shops as a result of leveraging the skills platform. We tend to have this policy whereby um, if we spot a game with great retention metrics and great early metrics, we're willing to invest dollars in, into UA. But I can't stress enough that um, we also work with larger game developers who have an established audience and have an established traffic base. And it's the combination really of, of those uh, folks bringing their, um, the, the players that want to play competitive games onto our platform um, together with us monetizing those games that works really well. Uh, make no bones about it, the engine that we've created is a real monetization engine. So the ability to bring some players into that and start to monetize is really key. But for those games that are triggering our internal systems that say this is, this is a game to watch, we certainly, we certainly uh, put some UA behind that. I see a question uh, that says, uh, are skill games usually real-time or PV PvP or, or async? Uh, and we have the ability to support both. Um, is there a type of game that works best in terms of monetization? Um, Monetization sort of is a function of uh, the number of games that a player can play in the allotted time that they have per day. Um, so there are some best practices that we've discovered, like keeping game time short. Uh, um, as part of that, obviously, having clear and concise rules, uh, having an evergreen experience so that the gameplay doesn't change significantly from one match to another so players can sort of get their bearings and feel fair. Um, those are the types of games that we see working really well. Um, a lot of casual games, um, that have uh, been familiar and or sort of household names for a long time. So we see uh, bubble shooters doing really well. We see solitaire games doing really well. Um, match games, of course. Uh, I hope that answers your question. And another one just came in from, from Heath. Is there a certain amount of time we're, we're set to, to play? And I think that does vary game to game, but typically there is a, a sweet spot of timing in a competitive game, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, what we really want to be doing is bringing players together uh, and creating a really uh, compelling experience for them. Yeah. So, in terms of uh, how long a player can play, uh, I just want to make sure that I set some context for the, the way that we're answering. I, I, can, I can read this multiple ways. Um, there's a, a virtual currency version and a, sort of a cash version, uh, which I described earlier in the presentation. Um, if the question is asking about whether or not uh, the energy system that's used in order to play um, needs to be refilled, the virtual currency system um, is, plays and behaves similar to what players would expect in a free-to-play model, where they get a certain amount of virtual currency in the beginning. They use that as an energy in order to play games. Um, the games themselves, are lim we try and limit by time. Uh, the reason for that is really just to improve velocity and to um, uh, improve the competition, uh, improve the focus for the player during the experience. Um, winning matches obviously gives you more currency. This is true for virtual currency and cash games. Yeah. Uh, I think that probably answers both. Yeah, no, I, I think it does. And I think we're probably up against the mark, but um, Haley uh, submitted a question uh, about solitaire games on our platform. So for games like solitaire where chance is a factor due to the randomness of card decks. How do we ensure that competition is fair and it doesn't break that kind of skills algorithm that I talked about earlier? Yeah, so there's different ways of handling that. Um, Solitaire historically has been a game that sort of played just by time. Um, and there's ways that uh, meta, sort of meta layer systems can be added to gameplay in order to focus on the skill pieces of it. Mm -hmm. um, so the draw of 
the cards from the top uh, is more can be more or less random or feel random from a player's perspective, but the strategy and how they're sort of sorting those of the tableau piles down below uh, and or sorting those to uh, the foundation piles above allow them to get different kinds of score, uh, allow them to earn more or less points. Um, and then playing that against a times model uh, where if a player is able to sort of compete, I mean complete the uh, the, uh, solitaire, the solitaire stacks um, for time runs out, then they're able to get bonuses. Those um, types of mechanics, they focus uh, the player strategy, and that's really where the skill comes from. Um, having things like uh, undos uh, and um, three card versus a single card draw, those change the game uh, in a way that um, amplify the skill of a player. Okay, interesting. Um, just checking the questions. Nathan, you've got the list there coming in. Um, I see a question for uh, how do you recognize the game, um, how do you recognize if it's a skill game or a chance-based game? Uh, <clears throat> that, I guess high level, uh, what we're really looking for obviously when bringing games on is to make sure that they're skill-based. That's really important for making sure that we have a fair foundation. Um, Chance-based games, uh, they, are, they have random elements that can happen in them. Um, so let's see, a free-to-play game might have uh, a gotcha mechanic, right? And so uh, let's say it's a CCG, for example. I'm just, thro just throwing one out there. Um, that's the type of game where it's a, typically a team-building game. Um, there's units that you sort of acquire through this randomized uh, piece. Um, that informs how you want to use your team. Uh, when you go up in a competition from one player to the other, uh, or one player versus another, you have these teams that those players have been constructed and they can exist differently. Um, they can exist over long periods of time because of sort of how that chance mechanic, the gotcha mechanic, has been influencing that team building. And those um, types of games uh, are much more difficult to balance and tune um, for the skills platform because <clears throat> uh, that chance element has has so much of an effect on the game. Uh, a simpler version of that would be like in a sports game, right? In a sports game, there's two halves. Uh, in, a, in a game like pool, for example, um, who breaks first uh, can have a large impact on who on what the, the overall outcome. By adding a halftime or adding the ability for both players to sort of uh, go first allows us to simplify um, that. It allows us to simplify gameplay, and it allows us to simplify the advantage, uh, and uh, in favor of being skill-based. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there are two essential tests that that we perform as well. There's the predominance test, which tests if a game falls closer to pure skill than pure chance, and then the material element test, which tests if chance plays a material role in the game's outcome. And that that's also kind of like the meta level test that determines something. Uh, is skills based or not? Um, we did have a question around, you know, how do we how do we find uh, clarity in the ocean of application? How, you know, discoverability is is a big issue, and I would say um, we we have excellent relationships with Apple as well as Samsung. Um, the relationship with Samsung, which you know, think about it, <clears throat> powers over 70 million devices in the U.S. and represents a significant portion of the marketplace. Uh, we have a relationship with them such that um, we work with them to promote and feature games on a pretty regular basis from the skill stable. And similarly with Apple, we have, um, we have a like-for-like a, a -like relationship. Um, also, we've got um, uh, all of our games listed at developers.skills.com or games.skills.com. Yes. Um, and I think you know, that, that is really a great starting point for anyone, either as a player wanting to play games or as a developer wanting to, um, as we draw traffic to that website, to, to really have distinction of being on the on the skills platform. Okay, do we need proof the game is skills based legally? Well, I, I think we kind of deal with that as a yep. developer. You come to skills, we we do uh, sort of design workshops, we do do first impressions, and out of that, we're able to determine whether or not a skills based element or mechanic can be applied to the game. Yep. Um, and then we have ways of verifying that too. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. So Hero, I, I hope hopefully mm -hmm. that answers your question. Um, 
and we've got we've got questions around. Okay, so I've got a risk style game that has good retention metrics. So for for individual developers' games, what we can do is take uh, take your question offline and have and have detailed conversations uh, with with you about how well your game would work on skills. So thank you for those questions. Um, a question uh, that popped up, and, and we do hear from time to time, actually re revolves around uh, Amazon's recent announcement. They came out, out with a game on announcement. I think, from my standpoint, you know, firstly, this is a great—it's a great sign. It's, it's just simply real validation for this as, a, as a, an ongoing marketplace and an ecosystem. It's real validation for what we do. I think, but to say they're direct competitors is a little like you know, we've got this saying in England: it's like comparing chalk to cheese. It looks the same, but it certainly doesn't taste the same. Um, they. Essentially, Amazon do what they do best. They do price fulfillment for competition, and they, they do not do sort of cash rewards uh, for skills-based gaming. Their value is really in price fulfillment, not in monetization. Uh, we also have an entire tech stack, and I talked about that, that does everything from world-class anti-cheat detection, player matching, based upon skills comparisons, uh, all of the live operations of running the tournaments, as well as being a monetization machine. And again, that's that's a distinction of what we do versus the price fulfillment that, uh, that they do. So hopefully that answers that question. And we're just looking through some of the other questions. Yeah, Heath, uh, what game do I play? I'm really into games, and I have all kinds. Um, again, please go to uh, skills.com website, uh, games.skills.com, and uh, take a look at the list of games that you can start, start playing and earning money. That's I, awesome. I see a question that asks if we're on iOS. The answer is absolutely yes. I think that was an easy one to take. Yeah. iOS and Android, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I think that pretty much wraps it up. I, I see a drying up of questions, um, but participants are hanging around, so thank you very much for, uh, for sticking around and hearing answers to those questions. And if you have any Further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out directly. And I think, David, you're going to take yeah. the folks through yep. how they do that. Thank you, Craig and Nathan. Appreciate it. We have one more poll question for you guys, and that is, if you'd like to learn more about the Skills Platform, please just answer, and we'll be back to you. We'll get back to you. So we're just about out of time today. A few quick things before we go. Uh, watch for an email with a link to today's presentation. Feel free, again, to share that with your colleagues. Watch it again. If you have any questions about skills or interested in learning about how we can help you monetize your game, please send us an email at developers at skills.com. Again, that's developers at skills.com. Thanks again for so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your day or evening.